gonna cover the five things you absolutely must do to your LS if you want it to be reliable. You do these five things, very strong chance you won't have any issues. You don't do these five things, pretty likely you will. The LS can get a bad rap for certain things and a lot of it is just lack of foresight, not doing a few really simple things that can prevent you having issues down the road. So I'm currently putting together this L92. It's a 6.2 liter aluminum block out of an 07 Escalade. And we're kind of building this thing up nicely. You know, I'm going through and, you know, doing ARP cam bolts and ARP head bolts and new head gaskets, new lifters, new trays, new timing chains. This is good. the first time I put a new timing chain on one of these. Hardened push rods, you know, all that good stuff. We're not opening up the bottom end or anything crazy like that. Uh, but we're going a little while with it just because it's a nice and relatively expensive base engine i just i kind of want to it's kind of fun to put nice parts on your engine but you absolutely do not need all of this stuff again you only need five things and the necessity to do these five things is based solely on if you're using this car for drifting or road racing you something where it's under a lot of strain it's these sustained high rpm sustained g loads switching in g loads so something like a a drift car, you're in drift, you're going from one direction to the other, the car is experiencing G-loads both directions, you're road racing in the corners. I mean, hell, even if you're doing an Australian style burnout at a Cletus in cars, uh, this would apply to you, but it, it does not apply to you in the sense of something like my Silverado 1500 here. This thing's got a six liter, it doesn't have any of these five things done, and it's fine because this is a street truck, it tows stuff around, I maybe do a burnout here and there. Um, it's not under high stress, high G loads, high sustained RPM. It's a cruiser. So keep in mind, we're not talking about cruisers here. We're talking about things that are gonna get the snot beat out of them consistently. Not once in a while, a lot. They're gonna get the crap beat out of them all the time. That's what you're talking about and that's when you need to do these five things. Also, it's worth noting that I came up with this list through trial and error. If you ask someone what you need to do, what you don't need to do for an LS swap in your drift car, you're gonna get a, a different answer for every person you talk to. Some people will say, you gotta do all this. Some people will say, you don't need to do any of that. And uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle and I've kind of figured out what I think should be done and what seems to work for me through trial and error. The first motor I had in this car, I went with the, I don't need to do all that crazy stuff mentality. Rod knocked it first drift event. Learned my lesson, made some changes. This motor has been in there for a year and a half. Gets driven three to four times a month at drift events. Spends a lot of its life at rev limiter, getting the snot beat out of it all the time. And it's been 100% fine, not a single issue. So what are the five things? Internal oil seals. So everyone focuses on changing their valve cover gaskets, their valley cover gasket, their front main seal, their rear main seal. If they want to swap, they don't want this thing to leak. However, what often gets neglected is the very few internal oil seals that need replacement as well. So the first one that is often forgot is on your cam retainer plate. So this is one I always forget myself. I often don't think about it until I'm putting a cam in and then I realize I don't have it and then I've got to order it. Let me show you. So this is your cam retainer plate. This is what holds your cam in the engine, keeps it from walking back and forth. So you've got these two oil passages Oil comes through here, boom, crosses over going that way. And then you have this seal. Now, every single one of these I've taken off. This is a 100,000 mile motor. Um, I've taken them off 200,000 mile motor, 70,000 miles. They all look like that. They are completely flat, very brittle. Um, the chances of that, that sealing when you put it back on, to me, seem pretty unlikely. I mean, there is not much of a seal left there to seal anything. Now this seal leaks, you're not gonna notice it. It's not gonna leak out of your engine, it's behind the timing cover, but it will cause you to lose pressure because it will be leaking pressure out and that'll just kind of be dripping back down into your pan. This is something very important to replace. If you're not coming in here, you're not doing a cam or anything, I would say you could probably avoid doing this unless you know you know the motor has low oil pressure issues that would be worth changing. But if you're if you're touching the cam, if you're pulling any of this stuff off, I mean, hell, even if you're just changing your front main seal, it's worth doing because it's not that hard to pull the cam gear off, pull this off, swap another one on. So that's the first overlooked one. The second one is at the back. There's what's called a dumbbell or barbell. They, it's under a few different names. So this is an aftermarket aluminum one. Basically, we're standing at the back of the block. This one goes in just like that. It's got an O-ring here and basically a metal on metal seal here where it goes into the block. So what this does is this prevents your oil from bypassing the filter. Your oil is gonna come in here. It's gonna hit this, have to go down into the filter element. Then it'll come out through the filter and up through the rest of your engine. 
So these aluminum ones are a little bit tighter tolerance to prevent oil from bypassing the filter. Uh, basically, you just end up with a lower micron count filtration because you're not allowing so much of it to bypass it. Um, but if you do lose this back seal, same situation where it'll just leak out down into the pan, you won't know, you'll just lose oil pressure. So. This is another one, it's simple enough to replace. Again, I always do these aluminum ones uh, because on my LS Miata, I have a dry sump and this is basically what prevents my oil pressure from f feeding its way to the front of the engine instead of going where it needs to go. So it's a little more crucial for me, um, but definitely worth replacing even if you just replace it with an OEM one. I just like the little aluminum ones. They seem to work well. They are noticeably tighter when you install them. And lastly, probably the most common one that, that is the least forgotten on the bottom the oil pickup too. Now I have the pump off of this engine because this is going to be going dry sump as well. I won't be using this factory wet sump pump, but the pickup tube o-ring is very, very important. You can see on this engine, a slight cause for concern for me pulling this apart. Very loose in there. It should kind of have, you should have to kind of press it in and kind of pop in this one. Not the case. You can see how much I can wiggle it around. The other design flaw we have to deal with as well is the pump has two bolt holes, two threaded holes on it. However, GM uses a one bolt pickup. So they do sell a brace to bolt on here to basically hang on to this other side. So you utilize both bolt holes. Now that's important because what can happen is over time, this can wobble around, flop around, you know, all the weight that you have back through here. It can wear out that O-ring. Now if that O-ring goes, you're losing oil pressure. Imagine it like this. It's like trying to suck through a straw with a hole in it. Your pump is sucking the oil from the bottom of the pan up and then pumping it through your engine. If the O-ring's torn and it's sucking in air through here, that's most of what it's gonna do. It's gonna suck air in instead of oil because it's not gonna be able to build up the pressure to suck the oil up in it. Uh, so this is a very important one. Again, this is probably the most commonly changed one uh, because generally, if you're doing an LS swap, you have to change the oil pan anyway, uh, which normally comes with a different pickup too with a new O-ring. So this is one that's not super often overlooked, but if you're not changing your pan, definitely worth looking at your pickup tube O-ring. And I, on every engine that I've used a wet sump on, I've put the brace on there just to be extra safe. Again, if this fails, it's no bueno. There's no coming back from that. All right, time to move on to thing number two. Lifters. So this is a suggestion if you have a Gen 4 engine, uh, pretty much pertinent if you have a Gen 3 engine. Uh, we won't go into the differences between a Gen 3 and a Gen 4 engine. Um, that's something you should know when you're buying an engine, whether you're getting a Gen 3 or Gen 4, because a lot of stuff will depend on that, like your engine electronics and yada yada. Moral of the story, the Gen 3 lifters were very prone to failure. Now, if your lifter fails, that's bad news because what happens? One, you're gonna wipe out your cam lobe. Two, you're gonna send a lot of metal through your engine. Neither of those are good things. Both are gonna require you disassembling at a minimum the top end of your engine. So the Gen 4 lifters are called LS7 lifters. If you look it up, if you're trying to buy some, just type in LS7 lifters and that the Gen 4 lifters are what comes up. It just means the redesign. So what is the difference? This is a Gen 3 lifter. As you can see, the roller tip is almost completely exposed. It's just got these two little tabs holding it in place. Now what can happen is those can break, your roller tip can go flying or turn sideways or many things can happen and cause you to wipe out your cam lobe. As you can see on the Gen 4 one, the roller tip is almost completely encased, just the tip being exposed where it needs to roll on the cam. This also gives you more surface area for where the lifter rides on the inside of the lifter bore. Um, so both of those are good things. Both of those are improvements. Definitely, again, especially if you're gonna beat on it, something you wanna to do to a Gen 3 engine is upgrade the lifters. They're really not that expensive either. You would think they might be. It's like 100, 120 bucks for a set of lifters and trays for your entire engine. Uh, the other thing that's nice about changing the trays is the lifter tray can break. And basically, your lifter has these two flat spots on it, and those are what locate it in the lifter tray. Obviously, it has to be in a certain orientation, for the cam spinning to spin on the roller correctly. If this turns sideways, it's bad news. It's not gonna roll. You're gonna have a lot of friction there. Again, you're gonna wipe out your cam lobe and it's gonna be a mess. Uh, so yeah, the, the older trays can break and then basically there's nothing to hold the lifter straight. It's in a smooth bore and it can just spin around as it may and wreak havoc. So lifters are a very important thing to do to your Gen 3 engine. Moving on to thing number three. 
rocker arm upgrade. So your factory rocker arm has this cap pressed into it. Looks like this on the inside. So you've got the center support. This is what bolts into your head. And then you've got these two sets of needle bearings. So when you take those apart, you got the cap, the internals, and you just have a bunch of little rollers just hanging out loose in there. So what happens is, especially at higher RPM, again, this is very important when you're uh, you know, running an engine at higher RPM, there's nothing to hold this cap in other than the friction of it being pressed in. So this cap can back out like that. Boom, cap comes off, boom. Needle bearings everywhere. So then you've got needle bearings floating through your engine. Obviously not good, getting picked up in the oil pickup, getting lodged in places, not good. Not something you want to have happen. So to resolve this, a trunnion upgrade is in order. So there's a couple of types of trunnion upgrades. On this engine, I am doing the brass trunnion upgrade. Uh, but basically, on the brass one, it replaces that whole assembly with a much beefier center, two brass bushings instead of roller bearings, and then snap rings on either end to prevent anything from backing out and falling off. It is now contained. The only way we're losing this is if this snap ring pops off, which as you probably know, pretty unlikely. The other option is the what I have in the LS Miata currently. Same basic concept as this, just with instead of a brass bushing here, it's just a beefy roller bearing with the snap ring still. So that you know the main solution is having something external to prevent everything from falling out. That's when you cause problems. The roller bearing isn't necessarily the problem, more so the bearing cap popping out. So yeah, you know, if, if, if it's going to be in a car that you're going to daily spend a lot of time street driving, you know, put a lot of miles on, I would, I would think the roller bearing would be the better option. Um, you know, my car is pretty much purely a track car. It does see some street use, but you know, I, I'm not going to put that many miles on it. Uh, the brass is a little more durable. It's just doesn't have the same longevity as the roller bearing. But either way, it's a good option and pertinent to uh, ensuring the health of your LS engine. You can see all my rocker arms here, ready to go back on the engine. Thing number four. So this next one, in my opinion, is the most important thing and the, the main thing that you need to do to make your LS last. It is one downfall of the LS and there is a way to fix it. What's the downfall? Rod knock, oil starvation. How do you fix it? Good oil system. So the LS engine does not have a priority main oiling system. Now what that means is different engines have different kinds, but basically a priority main system would be where the oil pump pumps the oil to the main bearings and then down to the rod bearings first, and then they go up to the head last, more or less. On an LS, the LS pumps it up to the cam first, then down to the mains, then down to the rod bearings. So because of that, if you have any oil starvation where you don't have oil flow for a second, your rod bearings are the last thing to get oil and they're arguably under the most stress. So that's a, that's a big issue with the LS, a big design flaw. You know, you, you can hate LSs, you can love LSs, um, but you can't argue with them in the sense of they have great packaging. There's a million and a half of them. You can find these things anywhere. I mean, there's probably there's hundreds of, of aluminum block 6.2 L92 truck motors on eBay for 20, 2,500 bucks shipped. You can get parts at any auto parts store. Hate them or love them. Uh, you can't argue with the logic of four or 500 horsepower in a reliably. But to get there, to be reliable, you have to take care of their biggest Achilles heel, the oil system. So how do you do that? What do you do? Uh, there's two options. I went with the more extreme option because I wanted to ensure that that never happened again. I rod knocked my first motor, my first drift event because of oil starvation. <laughs> So where oil starvation comes into play is when the car is moving around and the oil is sloshing around in the pan. You have that pickup tube trying to suck that oil up and when you go under a high G load, all the oil moves away from the pickup, the pickup picks nothing up and then your, oil, your engine is starving of oil until that pickup gets underwater again. That's why it's called a wet sump because it's generally supposed to be wet, you know, under the level of the oil. So the simplest remedy for that is a good oil pan. So that is first and foremost um, on my roommate Ben's car here. We have, he has a baffled pan. So basically within the pan, there's little trap door baffles that allow oil into the sump area where the, the pickup tube is, um, but not out of it. So that, you know, as it's sloshing around, ideally the oil is collecting in the center. The other big thing that one must do, something I think is a necessity if you're gonna drift your car is an AccuSump. Uh, so basically what this is, 
is it's a pressurized cylinder. So it's got a piston. As it fills with oil, that piston compresses the air and it becomes under pressure. This fills up with oil, holds a certain volume at a certain pressure, and if your engine drops below a certain pressure, it will then supply the engine with that oil. Now that is usually enough to get you through those moments of starvation. You can see the line comes in here to this T. Then there is a check valve here. If the AccuSum does need to supply oil, instead of it going all the way up here and through the cooler and stuff, it just goes straight into the engine. And then that line, of course, runs all the way back to the AccuSum tank. So that is the simplest solution. Um, some people consider it a Band-Aid. I don't think it's a Band-Aid. I think it's a solution. You have a pressurized cylinder. When your oil pressure drops below a certain level, it supplies the oil until the oil pressure is back up and it fills back up and is ready to go for the next time. Imagine like a capacitor uh, for a car stereo. And uh, you know, that's usually enough because usually if you're starving, if the, oil, if the car is starving of oil, it's not starving of oil all the time. It's just under certain circumstances. Maybe road racing on a certain track and there's a really long corner where you're sustaining, you know, a G load all the way around the corner. Maybe Maybe the last half of the corner for two, three seconds is when you're starving of oil. It can supply oil for that amount of time. The rest of the track, you don't have a problem. So I think it's a good option. Um, it's definitely like a pretty foolproof option. Again, I went with the more elaborate option because it's a part I've always wanted. I went with a dry sump. So there is a pump down there. You can see that belt behind this belt. Uh, so basically it's a belt that runs from the crank pulley to the pump. The pump then, at the end of the cycle, pumps oil through my cooler, through my filter housing, and then up into my engine, through the engine, goes back to the pan. I have a dry sump pan, which has is completely flat. It has two fittings. The pump then sucks the oil. It's called a scavenge pump. It basically creates a vacuum. It sucks the oil out of the pan, so the oil does not stay in the pan. It only goes to the pan to leave. It doesn't hang out there like it does in a wet sump. Then goes through the pump, the pump pumps it back into my tank here. It comes into the tank up here, and then the pump sucks fresh oil from the bottom of the tank back up to itself, and then pumps it through the engine around, and the cycle returns. So my oil supply, there's oil in the lines, and there's some residual oil in the pan and in the engine, but my main oil supply is kept here in this baffled tank. So no matter what the car is doing, no matter what it's experiencing, the oil is not gonna slosh away from here. It's filled up to here. It, it physically can't get away from the pickup. So the benefit of this is you always have oil pressure. You're able to change your oil pressure. So the pump is adjustable. You can add oil pressure, you can take it away. The oil pressure is more consistent. You know, instead of being say 20, 30 PSI at idle and then 80 at wide open throttle, you know, it's pretty much like when it's hot, 50 at idle and 60, 65 at wide open throttle, high RPM. So you get more consistent oil pressure. The one big pitfall of a dry sump though, is you do have an external belt. So you can lose that belt, it can snap, you know, it could fall off, you get a rock in there that sends it off. And if that belt comes off, you have no oil pressure. Uh, so that is the one big pitfall. And we kind of considered that a lot when building Ben's car, you know, the pros and cons of everything. And that's why he decided to go with the AccuSump, mostly because yes, it's not as good of a system, um, but it is more foolproof in the sense that you don't have to worry about a belt on the front of your engine that could come off. Um, and then other than that, the cost. Uh, this is a pretty basic dry sump kit with the ATI damper and the tank and everything. It was like right at $3,000. And a lot of people think I'm crazy for spending that kind of money on an oil system. It doesn't make the car faster. It doesn't make the car better. Um, it just makes it essentially more reliable. And to me, it, it's absolutely worth it. Even with that motor, which is an L33, just 5.3 aluminum block. By the time I do the cam and the springs and go through and do the gaskets, get the engine, you know, put it all together, you know, I'm, I'm at about 1,500 bucks, $2,000 into the engine and then my time to swap the engine and then whatever I'm missing out on. You know, if I tow my car to California and I rod knock my motor because I didn't have a dry sump, then that trip's wasted. That trip could have cost more than three grand. Uh, so to me, you know, if, if it saved me from blowing up another motor, it paid for itself. I think it's worth it. And it was one of those nerd parts I've always wanted. So, you know, one of those things. At a bare, bare minimum, you need a really good baffled pan. I tried that on this car. This car had a good baffled pan and I still rod knocked it. I still had starvation. I tried a good baffled pan on this car as well. It's just a bone stock iron block 5.3. Didn't work either. Every time I've drifted it, the car has lost more and more oil pressure and the motor needs replacement. So I say at a bare minimum, you need the pan and an AccuSump if you're going to do something like drifting or road racing, or again, Australian style burnouts at Cletus and cars consistently. You know, if you're only gonna go do burnouts once a year, you could probably get away with a baffled pan. 
Um, but again, if you're gonna drive your car very hard, performance drive it, all those things, you absolutely should do an AccuSump. You know, the AccuSump ends up costing like six to 800 bucks with the lines and fittings and everything. I know it sounds like a lot for something that doesn't make your car faster, but it is the one downfall of the LS, is the oil system. You fix the oil system, they don't really have many other issues. Everything else is, is minimal stuff that's, I mean, you know, the lifters and stuff, that, that's just something you're doing preventative maintenance because that design could fail as opposed to the other ones that pretty much never fail. Uh, the oil system is just the one main thing that is a problem. And you see a lot of people will buy an LS3 crate motor and they'll put a basic little pan on it, no AccuSump, and then rod knock it. And they don't understand why their $8,000, $9,000 crate motor blew up. Well, it blew up because you starved it of oil. Oil and fuel are the lifeblood of your engine. I mean, if you have oil and you have fuel, the right amounts of each, you're, you're probably gonna be okay. It takes a lot for something else to go wrong in an LS if you have a good oil supply. So, you know, that, that is the most important thing. And then the last thing, thing number five, you guys are gonna like this one. Don't with it. Just don't, just don't mess with it. Don't do it. That's so many people go down the rabbit hole, as I like to call it, the, the while you're there's. Oh, why well, yeah, are the heads off? I might as well pull the crank out and pull the rods off and take the pistons out and do new rings and do new rod bearings, do new main bearings, do ARP stuff. Don't mess with it. GM knew what they were doing when they put this engine together. There's people making 800,000 plus horsepower on stock bottom ends. Your naturally aspirated 350, 400 horsepower car is gonna be just fine. It's gonna be just fine, don't mess with it. Again, this motor was assembled in a factory, you know, with, with machines that torque everything in the exact right sequence, the exact right torque spec, and everything in its place exactly as it should be. GM is a lot better at building this engine than I would say 90% of the people who could put this engine together. You can debate that all you want, doesn't matter. My point is, you can do top end stuff all day. You know, you gotta pull the heads to do the lifters, not a big deal. You can change a head in the car. You can change a lifter in the car. None of that stuff's a big deal. There's not a whole lot to mess up on it. Don't touch the bottom end. Unless it's a questionable motor, you know, like the motor in the RX-7, when I pull that out, I'm gonna have to because it has low oil pressure. I need to verify if the bearings are good. And if it's a really high mileage motor, it might be worth popping a couple rod caps off, taking a look at the bearings, seeing if they look good. As long as they look good, put it back together as you found it. Don't mess with it. I mean, you've gotta remember this thing's lasted 100, 150, 200,000 miles as it is. What are you gonna to do to improve that? If your bearings aren't worn out, there is no reason to replace them. If your engine is not questionable, there's no reason to tear into it. Like, yes, if you're trying to make 2,000 horsepower, you gotta build your motor. If you're gonna try to rev to 9,000 RPM, you gotta take it apart and you gotta change things, yes. But for the most part, for the gr grand majority of people, you don't need to open the bottom end. Leave it alone, get it in your car, go drive it, have fun with it, and enjoy it. And yeah, that wraps up the five things you need to do to make sure your LS is reliable. Let me know if I left anything out, I forgot anything, anything you'd like to add. But other than that, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing. Goodbye. Oh. Oh my he didn't even take a lap, he was just out there. That was cool. This guy.